Today, I spoke to a few friends of mine and asked them if they were going to speak on this horrendous revelation of sexual abuse of minors and sexual abuse of those who were in seminary studies. One priest said to me, he said, I'm too ashamed. Another one said, I'm afraid. I had the 8.30 Mass this morning, and I gave some indication of what I was going to speak to you about tonight. I think most people understood what I was saying, but as I said to you earlier, some people are determined not to understand, or some people sincerely misunderstand. After tonight's remarks uh, at the Mass, I will be in the vestibule. You have to wait one at a time. If you have questions, I'll do my best to answer those questions or to clarify what I have said. But as I said to you earlier, uh, there was someone determined uh, not, not to hear. So uh, please listen, listen very carefully. Uh, if you have a question, then please uh, bring a question to me, but do it in a polite, do it in a polite way. I don't take the people yelling at me. Uh, priests are human beings, and uh, priests have feelings, and this is a horrendous uh, moment, uh, not just for the priests, but it is horrendous for the church uh, in our country and in different places in the world. There has been nothing so tragic since the Protestant Reformation. Many will not see it that way, but I am telling you now, this is a very, very serious issue. It will not go away in one generation or two generations. The church will never be the same. Most of us won't be here to see what eventually comes about, but it is going to take a tremendous amount of, of work and prayer. And I'll talk a little bit about that toward the end of my remarks. Now, there are two situations that we are dealing with. The first one are the revelations that came out of the state of Pennsylvania, where there were over 1,000 cases of reported abuse by over 300 priests. This is astounding. I knew that the problem existed. We've had a taste of this in the past, but I had no idea that it was as big a problem and as many people involved as the report indicates. Some of the statements in the report are not just troubling, they are repulsive. They're repulsive. Now, we've had, in the past, had to deal with clergy abuse of minors, and the Bishop gave us the Dallas Protocols to deal with that, how to handle a complaint. For the most part, the bishops uh, have been compliant with the Dallas Charter, except, except that many of the cases were not reported by the bishops, and many priests, many priests, instead of being removed from ministry as far back as 40 years ago, they were just transferred from place to place. That is unconscionable. It is unconscionable. Now, the problem with the abuse of minors is this. Only about 5% of those abused were children, 5% were children, heinous, despicable. Children means those who are prepubescent. These are kids, seven, 10 years old, younger. For the most part, for the most part, little boys, but of course they were, I believe, from what I'm reading now, there are a few girls, but not many girls at all. The second category are those 
who are what we call post-pubescent. Post-pubescent. That means they have reached puberty. They could be from 12 to 17 years old. These cases are involved with homosexuality. Now, a lot of people are going to get rattled up and say, how dare you say that about homosexuals? That's not politically correct. Let me be clear about this with you. I'm not saying that homosexuals are pedophiles. Not all homosexuals are pedophiles. Be clear about that. Nor are all homosexuals abusers of children. Be clear about that. But what I am saying is, for the most part, these 95% of the cases were cases where the priest, clergy involved were after young men. And these young men found themselves in situations which they could not give any kind of a free consent. Why? You might say, well, some of them went along with what the priest did to them. The fact of the matter is this. A priest, like anyone in a position of power, has power over people, and especially young people. Young people at that time of their life sometimes are psychosexually confused. They haven't made a clear understanding of who they are sexually in their minds. And so they are vulnerable people. Some of these children, they came from homes where there was no father image. The priest stepped in to be that father image, seemingly, seemingly so. And in those cases, in those cases, we have, in effect, homosexual activity. What happens with those people, those young boys who are abused, is this. It leads to further sexual confusion. It leads to an inability to establish a good, wholesome relationship with a woman. Their marriages are oftentimes in difficulty, those who are abused. They go into depression. And finally, there are cases of those who have committed suicide. Now, those cases are criminal. They are a crime. And those cases, therefore, call for justice. There should be punishment in those cases. But a couple of things intervene. And let me tell you what those couple of things are. We have to abide by the rule of law. Some of these cases pass what we call a statutes of limitation. And therefore, they can't be prosecuted because a certain number of years have passed. Statutes are a wise thing. Why? because memories fade, people die, and evidence disappears. So civil laws always recognize statutes of limitation. So some of these old cases, they don't fit into the category of the statutes, and therefore they cannot be prosecuted. Okay. The uh, second thing is this. This is a mistake, a mistake that the bishops made in the past. But maybe if I were in their shoes, Maybe I would have done the same thing. They listen to lawyers and psychologists. So, first thing you do with a litigious society that we have, you call the lawyer. What should I do? And a lot of times, agreements were reached, settlements were reached when people complained for a sum of money. And you would say, well, this sum of money will make you whole. It comes from the idea of a tort. You've ever studied law. To make a person whole, to give you this money to help you get on with your life and get the psychological and medical help, whatever you might need. And of course, attached to those is a promise of silence, non disparagement. I won't talk about this. And people settle, oftentimes because they thought it was the best thing to do. Let's just move on uh, with, with life. And sometimes people were just awed. They were just awed completely by you know, the, the priest and the bishop and the lawyers and, and people settled. Okay. So that's how a lot of times 
these cases became cases where uh, they, were, they were dormant, they, they were silent. Okay? Now, in Pennsylvania, and I'm sure this is going to happen in more, in more states, and I've been told that New York is uh, trying to uh, remove the statutes of limitations on these cases. There will be more cases that are going to be revealed. Pray God, not to the extent that we've heard uh, thus far, thus far in Pennsylvania. Okay. There's a second category that we have to talk about here. It's a little bit different. A little bit different. You have heard about the scandal regarding Cardinal McCallum. Now, in these cases, we are often dealing with, there's a case of a younger boy at St. Patrick Cathedral. I forget exactly how old he was, but he is the original whistleblower. But then there are a number of cases reported of the Cardinal's activities uh, in visiting his seminarians and the seminary. Reports are also coming out now from places like the Honduras and Chile that the seminaries are infested with homosexual people. Again, I am going to be very clear with you. I am not saying homosexual people are bad or evil. I'm just telling you what has happened. And in these circumstances, you have some very vulnerable young men. Yes, they are vulnerable young men. You might say to yourself, well, you know, they're over 18 years old. Does it make them legal? Yeah. Does it make it moral? No. So if somebody has reached the age of 18, they've uh, reached the point where they are responsible for their own life and their own decisions, can be prosecuted by criminal law. No. But there is a moral law. It's a higher law. And when we talk about abuse, what kind of abuse is that? It's taking advantage of someone who is in a lower position than you are and is flattered by a priest, a seminary rector, a bishop, or a cardinal who takes special interest in them. And it's so flattering. He, he likes me. And then, of course, there are the little, uh, little promises or little gifts that might be dangling in front of them. You belong in Rome. Gee, someday you might become a bishop. How would you like to spend a weekend with me at my summer house? And all of a sudden, you have a young man who finds himself mesmerized and caught up in a situation which he would never have accepted in the past. Now, what happens is that some of these people, they again blew the whistle. This is what happened. And this is the situation that has made all of the newspapers, including the front page of the Naples Daily News. It's awful. There is no word that can explain how sad I am to have to speak to you like this tonight. But what happens next is this. Once you begin to allow homosexual behavior in the seminaries, the other people, the heterosexual people, they leave. And it becomes a very comfortable situation for those who are psychosexually confused, immature, or have decided that they are indeed homosexual. In organizational theory, one of the first things we learn is like brings on like. So what the boss is, he's going to bring on people who are like him. And the second thing we learn is personnel is policy. You can't
place people in places who are going to do what you want them to do. And so, religious orders have a high number of homosexuals. Chancery offices have a high number of people who reflect the boss in some places, not all. Some places, not all. And of course, some seminaries begin to get a reputation as being a place where homosexuals can feel comfortable. It is, in the priesthood, in seminaries, it is very easy to fall into this. It's safe, it's secure, you have friends there, you're oftentimes involved with some very, very intimate conversations about your life and your hopes and your dreams. And then the place, the priesthood, begins to turn lavender. And that's what has happened. That's what has happened. Now, the numbers that I had, I, again, I, I could be completely wrong on this, about 10%, are usually old numbers, of priests had a homosexual proclivity, 10%. Average population, 2%. What about the bishops? The numbers of what I've been reading, and I, again, you can't believe everything you read, is about 40%. Now this is dangerous territory that I'm treading on. But I've been there before. And if I don't tell you the truth, well, I have to answer to God. You get to my age, you don't worry about what you missed in the past. You worry about what's coming in the not too distant future. I could go on about this, but I don't really want to go on. It's one of the saddest moments in my priesthood. For the first time in my life, I said I wanted to retire. Somebody said, are you going to retire? I said, no. I'm not going out of St. Agnes this way. I'm going out that way. For a lot of priests, the good guys want to retire. They've had it. They've had it. Now, what am I going to ask you to do? What am I going to tell you to do? I don't have all the answers to this. Maybe I've got the answers. First thing, this is usually to save it for the last thing. I'll tell you, pray. Yeah. That's the first thing you start to do. You better start praying. You gotta pray for the church. You pray for the priest. You pray for the bishop. The Holy Spirit comes and guides and strengthens and enlightens. Get the, get the seminaries cleaned up. Get the chanceries cleaned up. Get the Vatican cleaned up. Secondly, there has to be resignations. Some bishops and some cardinals have to go. And maybe the Pope has to go too. Because when you start telling people, who am I to judge? That's one of the problems. Nobody wants to make a judgment anymore what's right and what's wrong. That's not good theology. It's not Catholic. It's not moral. It's not human. You make judgments. The next thing we have to do is this. Lay people have to take responsibility. You have to take responsibility. You have to be the people of prayer. You have to be the people of complaint. You have to be the people who are going to say, we want this cleaned up. And this is what we propose to do. And this is what we suggest. You. You. Because we'll have priests won't. You know why? It's their job. It's the meal ticket. Nobody wants to lose their job. Nobody wants to be on the outs with the people who run the ins. So it's dangerous. There has to be people who are willing to be martyrs. And I'm not talking about going out and getting your, your head chopped off. 
not literally, but maybe figuratively. It's called white martyrdom. Some priests have to be white martyrs. Speak the truth. Take the consequences. Know that God will take care of those who are faithful to him. And lastly, this is not going to be cleaned up in my lifetime or your lifetime. It's going to take a hundred years. It's worse than the Protestant Reformation. Nobody will tell you that. I will. I don't know what the church is going to look like 10 years from now, 20, 50 years from now, but it's going to take a long time to get the church back together again. But there is something that you must believe. This is what is extraordinary. The church is the bride of Christ. The church will be purified in God's time. And when Christ comes again, he will leave the spotless bride, present the church to his father. And those who have been faithful will live with him forever.